Hello, Ocholo Kutapa is my name. It's been a while uh, back on the show, um, giving Bible answers to every relationship or marriage question. Uh, the question I want to address today is a very serious matter. You know, every time we teach the love of God and marriage, people are concerned like we want to keep people in their marriages and kill them even when the circumstances are bad. So in this very video, I'm going to be addressing what to do when the marriage becomes so toxic, so dangerous, and life is at stake. All right, now the first thing I would like to say is we don't loosely tell people to leave their marriages for anything. Because what the world wants us to do today is to give so much liberty that people may just wake up in the morning and say their partner did not greet them and they are out. Now this video is not to make excuses uh, such as that and just give people the leeway to walk away from marriages that can work. So the first principle I'll share with you is never walk away from a marriage that can work. Alright? If the marriage can still work, if the marriage has life, alright, you don't walk away from it. But let me jump ahead of myself and give a very clear principle of scripture before I go back to the subject of consideration today. Now in that clear principle of scripture, they wrote to Paul and the apostles in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 asking some marriage questions. He begins to have the conversation about sex and draws the line as to you know, the sexual condition of the world and what Christians should do and how Christians should approach the conversation on sex. Then he gets down to the real question as to people who are married to unbelievers. Let me also quickly give a context to the conversation in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Some believer, believing um, singles have taken 1 Corinthians chapter 7 as a liberty to marry unbelievers. That's not what the Bible teaches. What happened is that these guys, you know, were all unbelievers until Jesus died and some of them came into the faith. So they had this situation where, oh, I came into the faith, but my partner did not come into the faith. So the apostles said to them, you know what, if your partner isn't leaving, do not leave the marriage. So it was not a license to marry an unbeliever, but it was a guidance on how to stay married to an unbeliever. So the apostles began to explain that because your righteousness can sanctify your partner. Why is that in line with the principles of scripture? Absolutely in line with the principle of scripture because it is light that drives out darkness, not darkness that drives out light. All right, not because God wants to create an awkward situation. But here's the deal. In that circumstance, your light needs to come out. Now, that's a whole subject for another day, but I'll touch on it. Now, for most believers, the biggest trouble we have is that when we have an assignment from God, we become emotional. Now, if God wants you to bring salvation to your marriage, you are going to suffer like a martyr. You are not going to be touchy and emotional about every subject. For instance, I'll give you an example. It is standard for a couple to be happy. All right, but when you are on a certain kind of assignment, your happiness does not just become the most important thing on the table, but the assignment. So you have somebody who is interceding for their husband. You have somebody who is interceding for their wife. At that point, their role as an intercessor is a greater responsibility than the happiness they seek. Not because they are not entitled to happiness, but because they have embraced a ministry. So Paul says to them, you know what? you can sanctify your partner. He said, because the wife can be sanctified of the husband or the husband of the wife. But you know, the apostles were very, very wise and did not leave us to chance. And they said something very profound. He said, but if that partner leaves, you are not bound. Because a lot of times we bring church doctrine to play. I've seen people who families have refused to support to move forward because a partner left and they say doctrinally speaking until their partner is dead. Now, God will not bound, bind you to a person whose choices in life is wicked. All right? Some people even move on, have other spouses, totally move on. And people keep people bound religiously. The Bible says very clearly that if your partner leaves, the living was not put in the hands of the believer in that circumstance because there was a higher ministry, all right, than just living. But let's leave all of that. I said that was not my subject for today. So a marriage is very difficult. Now, you know, in the world in which we live today, we need to be honest about the circumstances we are dealing with. I have heard about narcissists, so many narcissists today, some speaking in tongues, if you notice. The apostles were very, very considerate in their response to this matter. All right, so when they said, if the spouse leaves, you are not bound, it was a very deep statement to make. Have you ever considered the word not bound? 
So where do we get all of the doctrinal debate and argument about, you know, who can remarry, who cannot remarry again? That's not my subject for the day. But let me quickly say this, that true scripture, it was not alien, all right, to suspend certain relationships. And I'm going to give you examples through scripture. It was never alien because certain relationships are deserving of suspension, even marriage relationship. That's why I tell people about the concept of constructive separation. Don't stay there and die. It is the living that can do marriage. The covenant of life is stronger than the covenant of marriage because the covenant of marriage stands on the covenant of life itself because it's the living that marries. And that's why when a person is dead, their spouse is wholly released for life. They can remarry. That's the one everybody is agreed on. Nobody's arguing against that doctrine. All right? So you want to stay alive. So if there's any threat to life or any threat to your well-being through even emotional abuse, now I'm going to give you a pathway to approach this. I do not hope it's your circumstance. So I'm speaking to people who are already there. All right? So I'm not speaking to people saying you will get there. You will not get there in Jesus' name. All right? But here's the deal. Number one, there is no marriage that doesn't have certain kind of authority structure, even if you marry a monster. There's either a father, an uncle, a church, or a spiritual leader. Now, I don't advise couples to run away by themselves. That has always worked against the marriage. Because what follows is you begin to see uh, accusations. You follow the man, you follow the woman. I don't know where you went to. It's important that when marriage needs constructive separation, that you go to an authority figure that can take you in or oversee the process of separation. Because separation in the Christian faith is not separation unto divorce, it is separation unto reconciliation as much as lie in our power. And what happens at that time is the couple are separated unto counseling because you want to fix the issue so that they can stay together without interference from external parties. All right. So advise couples. Don't just sit and make the decision. Now, the other reason why you run to an authority figure is sometimes your opinion may not be correct because you see some people who misjudge the circumstance put the blame on their partner, leave the home, then an authority figure sits with them and realizes that the problem is not what you thought it was or it was not as bad as you thought it was or you were actually even the one on the wrong. So when you go to such a person or such institution, this is not just you know validating your running, this is examining the problem. All right? So it's so important to realize that the Christian faith does not teach sit there till you die. That doctrine is not godly and nobody that knows the Bible is teaching it. All right? Our message may sound like it. For instance, when I begin to teach from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and speak about love having long suffering, all right? People just feel like, in fact, I've, I've preached messages like that that people begin to attack me. This is how you people kill people. You Christians. No, 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 no. Love still has long suffering. Because there are sufferings you will suffer in marriage that will not kill you. There are sufferings you suffer in marriage that does not amount to abuse by your partner. There are sufferings. For instance, we suffer for righteousness sake. i give you an example. So there's a story told of Smith Wigglesworth, true life story, whose wife was born again and who kept the tenets of First Corinthians chapter 7. Who was not born again himself? And she comes home, he locks the door on her. It was winter. She slept outside in the cold, the story goes. She wakes up in the morning, he opens the door, he goes, she goes straight in the kitchen, makes him his breakfast, and he breaks down, and is converted to the faith. Now, that man turned out to be a great man of God. I mean, the dead were raised to life in his ministry in multiples. He preached the gospel. I mean, till today, he's still speaking from nation to nation because of the materials that have come out of him, even after he's dead. Now, that's a couple or that's a partner who saw what God could do irrespective of what they were facing. That's not the circumstance I'm painting here. But let me say this before I further paint the circumstance. The marriage may ordain you into offices that will look like you're suffering and you would do it because you know the Lord and the Lord has put a word in your heart or a ministry in your heart. But let's come back here now. If your life is ever threatened, I repeat, if you are at risk, if you are losing your mind, don't sit there. Run to somebody who can be of help. You may go across board to your spouse's family. 
you may speak to your own parents you may speak to your spouse's pastor if they are still respectful of spiritual authority you may speak to your own pastor and let me say this and apologize on behalf of the body of christ we haven't done extremely well i must admit so sometimes i'll tell you please leave church alone leave church leadership because a lot of times why did i say i apologize church leadership is so burdened with so much that they cannot give you the kind of attention you need all right take matters into your hand your marriage needs help and that help begins from number one go to the right place number two the authority that may be able to separate you and fix the problem that's why certain times i find it very difficult when we challenge and attack the offices of people like therapists and uh, uh, um, counselors and all of that no what we should do is to have people who are believers occupy those offices because i give you an example if i want to learn how to drive i'll not go to my pastor to teach me how to drive i'll go to a driving school that's not teaching me something from the bible it's teaching me something in life so let's stop fighting and criticizing therapists and uh, psychologists and all of that. Let's raise Christians who can occupy those offices and give the time that a pastor cannot give to solve certain problems. I'm a minister of the gospel and I can tell you, there's a point you come to, you reach the end of you with a couple. There's nothing you can do. And that's where we wind up telling them, just pray about it. That is wrong. Pray about it doesn't fix everything. Just the way you not tell somebody that is hungry, let's pray about it. Just the way churches run charity for people to feed them. You not tell them, just keep listening to the word, you will prosper one day before you start eating. No! You take natural steps to fix natural circumstances while you apply spiritual solution through prayer and godly counsel. So, I beg you, some of you listening to me, you're already disappointed in your pastor. I apologize on his behalf. He doesn't even have the training and expertise to answer you. I can tell you the truth. He doesn't have it. He's also frustrated. He doesn't know what else to do after the prayer he has prayed. He's even wondering why his prayer has not worked. But there are natural sides to this. Again, I did not become a lawyer when I studied to become a lawyer by going to a Bible school. I did it by going to a university and going to a law school. So you may need specialized help, all right? If your partner is not ready to seek the help with you, if the situation is that toxic, you first of all need help. I tell you the kind of help you need. First of all, some people need to go to places where they will disabuse their mind from the abuse they have endured. Because when you meet some partners under certain circumstances, they already feel worthless, they already feel useless, because their partner has reduced them to nothing by the abuse they have faced. So you want to go to the right authority. You want to go to the right places to seek help. Don't sit there and die, all right? Do not, see, the church may even malign you. Some brethren may look at you and say, look at this one, she couldn't keep a marriage. Look at this one, he couldn't keep a marriage. Again, I repeat, the covenant of life is stronger than the covenant of marriage. And God would rather have you alive before he fixes your marriage and not have you dead from a marriage. All right? I will stop here for today. The greatest point I think you should take from today is you must run to the right authority and run to the right sources that can help you, first of all, receive you out of a place that can take your life and give solution that can restore the union. All right? And I really, really hope, share this video, uh, subscribe to this channel, talk to other people, I'll keep answering questions, and I'll say a bit more about this in other episodes of this conversation. God bless you. Uchulio Kutepa is my name.